Hello, uh, good evening, everyone, to my speakers and my dear friends and the viewers. I welcome you all to this International Keratogonus Symposium, which was conducted by Zuleika Hospital in, uh, from United Arab Emirates. Uh, and also thanks to Microsynergy for helping us in organizing this event. Uh, to start with, I would like to thank Dr. Rohit Shorty to help me in organizing this because I used to always uh, see his meetings and webinars the way he used to conduct. So I thought, let us, let me also have that experience of conducting a symposium. So he immediately accepted uh, my offer and then helped me in organizing the speakers as well as the sponsor. And I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Hafezi to have to spare his time to come and join us. And Dr. Gatinel, I hope you, have, uh, you remember me, I had visited and spend a day in your clinic and learn a lot of things. You also were quite cooperative in showing me the OR and all. It was a quite good experience about a couple of years back. And uh, also Dr. Mazin Sanjab, who is my uh, co colleague here in the UAE. It's always nice to learn lots of things from him. I think I should always, I'll, I want to recommend the beginners or even the fellow colleagues to go and visit his uh, YouTube channel, Sanjab Academy. It's really nice, informative, and the way he has explained the topography, it's quite good. And thanks to Dr. Shadi to come and accepting uh, in spite of the busy schedule. And last, and Dr. Gaurav Nutra, and he has helped me a lot before, and uh, it was a good time to meet him during the uh, conference in Dubai. And last but not the least, Dr. Rishi, who was a fellow runner. As always, we have never met actually outside, which is the first time we're actually meeting. So it's a pleasure. To start with, hi, to start with we'll have a. Uh, I just want all the viewers to have to keep the questions ready. So we should have a good discussion, and at the end we'll, we want you to have uh, to learn maximum from our eminent speakers. There's al al already a lot, many questions available. We'll try to uh, answer maximum as much as possible. So, uh, without wasting time, we'd like request Dr. Hafizi to start with his talk. With great, great pleasure. Yeah. So, um, thank you very much again um, for the organization and the invitation. And um, I will start my first presentations. Uh, we should be roughly at eight minutes per talk. Is that right? Uh, can you, uh, I just want Dr. Fiji, sorry, uh, uh, Dr. Fogla, invite you Dr. Fogla also, which I uh, was happy to learn from him the DSEC and DMAC course during the international conferences. Thank you. Dr. Fiji, you can start. Yeah. Professor Hafizi, okay. you can uh, you can take ten to twelve minutes. Uh, you can you can be at leisure because uh, we all are waiting to listen to your talk. We don't want you to rush through anything. Yeah, I will, I will try. Thank you very much. I will try not to rush, but this should be perfectly fine. So, <clears throat> um, I have um, two short talks today. The first one is about kids and keratoconus, and it's just a brief overview about some of the. Um, some of the particularities that you will encounter when you treat kids. On one hand, we, we all know that um, we have a whole arsenal of possibilities nowadays to, to diagnose. Diagnosis comes before treatment. And um, we know how important it is to screen early, but not everybody has all these fancy machines at hand. And um, at least in my practice, for example, in Switzerland, I have um, I have a large amount of uh, optometrists and even opticians sending me patients based on uh, suspicion of keratoconus, and some of them, many of them have a placebo-based topographer. Some of them don't, and still they are quite uh, they are quite accurate in the clinical suspicion. Why? Because they also. Um, have learned over the years to be very, very sensitive to things like these happening. A constant increase in, 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 uh, in the glasses prescription over, over a few years. This is a patient I've seen in 2016. He, unfortunately, the treating... Uh, can I interrupt you? I, we can't see your slides. I think your slides are not shared. Oh, we didn't share yet. Thank yes. you very much. Please interrupt me after two and a half seconds next time. Then, then I will then I will not speak without slides. So can you see these now? Yes. Do you see my slides? Yes, yes. yes. Fantastic, thank you. So 
again, if, if you don't have fancy machinery to uh, detect keratoconus, some of my referrers, which actually also include opticians, they are quite good in, in realizing that if you see something like this happening over the course of, of a few years, that is not normal. Uh, you may want to say that you are born with your astigmatism and you die with your astigmatism. And in between, you might have minor changes because somebody does a different refraction on you, but you cannot have a fourfold and then 12-fold increase on your left eye in your cylinder. So this is an unfortunate case of a young patient that had been monitored by their ophthalmologist, their non-surgical ophthalmologist, and just received new glasses over five years without any action taken. But um, again, as I said, many, many opticians are very sensitive to the topic now and detect such patients and send them early. I would say at the, at the mid stage, when they see a fourfold increase, they would send the patient immediately. So that's another way of detecting a suspicion. Now, what I have learned over the years is that keratoconus clinically is in its most active and aggressive state in children. So this is a patient um, I like to show because I, I learned my lesson and my, I burned my fingers on this patient. This was, uh, I think, 11 or 12 years ago. I saw the patient when uh, he presented with the topography of, uh, on the left side, um, young teenager. And at, and at that time, I didn't perform cross-linking immediately in kids yet. This was in 2008 or nine, I think. And I told him, come back after 12 weeks. And I, I thought that I would be say on the safe side uh, saying 12 weeks, but look what happened to that cornea in 12 weeks. So ever since I learned that 12 weeks might be way too long, if for some reason you decide not to treat immediately, then do not wait that long in children. Um, assess the age of the patient, uh, the symptoms, the, the history behind it. And I usually see very young patients after four weeks for the first time. And then I'm happy to extend, to extend um, the intervals. That's a 16-year-old patient where we see mid-November, mid-January, that's eight weeks, almost four diopters of increase. So massive increase in a short amount of time. So what I've learned in kids is screen early, screen family members of, of adult keratoconus patients. If you see something, either you take the attitude of treating directly or you see them in short intervals, do not wait too long. And when it comes to treatment, and I strongly suggest to treat every child and adolescent with a clear diagnosis, when it comes to treatment, then for now, my go-to protocol is the one with the strongest biomechanical increase, which for now still is the Dresden epi of protocol. <clears throat> you see on the right-hand side, that was my MD-PhD student, Arthur Hemmer. Some years ago, he checked the biomechanical stiffness of Dresden against accelerated cross-linking. This is how we started realizing the, the sudden drop in, um, in efficacy. This is for now in the beginning of 2020, but we now have very promising Epi on protocols, um, iontophoresis based pulsed light without additional oxygen, without a boost, that um, I think will, will be a very valuable alternative in the near future. I'm talking about the protocol that Cosimo Mazotta is uh, developing. He just published his data three or four days ago, his three year follow up in the JRS. So, but for now, um, I stick to this protocol that we developed with our foundation for children or low compliant patients, because it's a lot about compliance in these kids. If, um, if I'm facing a 10 year old that, that behaves in a mature manner and is calm, um, then I am not too worried about having uh, an increased risk during and after the surgery, especially after the intervention because of um, low compliance, eye rubbing, post-op infection. So in these cases, I treat with the Dresden protocol, a PF under local anesthesia. Now, if I am facing a patient with somehow reduced compliance, but still compliant enough for performing the procedure under local, but I'm worried about the behavior post-op, eye rubbing, then I switch to a P on already now. And if I am facing a patient that is absolutely zero compliant, 
I do a bilateral epion treatment under general anesthesia. And we've been doing this on a number of patients. This works fine too, but it is a, quite a challenge for the patient and the parents to make sure that there is no increased risk for post-op infection. So this is my, my current scheme and the scheme is dynamic. It might be modified and, and who knows, in a year I might be doing epion on all my pediatric cases and many more to come. So I'm really quite excited finally after all these years of, of trying to slow down the, the abundant use of epion because the protocols were not convincing. I have seen for the first time a con quite convincing protocol that on top of it does not need fancy machinery. Now, the reason I treat children and adolescents immediately is because um, eight years ago, we published uh, our paper on cross-linking in children. And on a side note, we checked the natural progression of the disease and we had a very high progression, progression rate of 88% in uh, children and adolescents from age six to 19 years. So if the likelihood is nine out of 10 that a child will progress once I detect the cone, I will not wait with my treatment. I will treat immediately. What we had seen at that time, uh, we had a three-year follow-up in our patients is that uh, stability was comparable to adults in the first and even in the second year, but then we started um, losing efficacy, beginning instability. So at the time, we were wondering how long the effect would last. A few years later, a, the, a Dutch group around uh, Robert Wisse has done a meta-analysis of all studies published that by then and found a potential instability after three years too. So the question is, why would the cornea become unstable after a few years? Well, let's look at this. If you look at the outcome of a cross-linking procedure, I usually give the cornea a few months to completely, to completely show the effect, the stiffening effect, I wait half a year, and then I assess the cornea. And I can have different outcomes, right? One we all like to, uh, to try to forget is the failure rate. Even in it be of cross-linking Dresden protocol, we have three to 7% of failure. So if I see a primary failure after half a year, and if you see a failure, it often happens in children and adolescents because they have the most aggressive form. Then I think about recrosslinking. But of course, we are much more often facing success with the EPIOF protocol. And when you talk about success, you can either be facing stability or a certain continuous flattening, flattening effect over one, two, three, four years. But there, the main question is how long will this process last? How long will your cross-linking last? And when do you eventually have to cross-link? Now, looking at the longevity of the effect, keep two factors in mind. We know now that the collagen turnover is six to seven years, maybe eight years. And we know that the older you get, the stiffer you get. Now, if you keep these two factors in mind, then imagine cross-linking a patient at the age of 27, the green arrow is the increase of the natural stiffness because of age. Then you cross-link at the age of 27. After six, seven, eight, ten years, for some reason my, my presentation does not move forward. Let's see. Now, now you cross-link at 27 and then the effect will wear off over the years. So a few years later, you are facing no more CXL effect, just the natural that increases a, a, a bit more with age. So most likely this patient in the long run will be stable because the patient has already reached a certain age. If you look at the exact same graph, but plotting cross-linking at the age of 12, well, how old is the patient a few years later? The patient will be barely 20. And 20 is an age where normally progression can occur. So we see that many young patients need close follow-ups and they need um, a recrosslinking after a few years. Last thing, going back to the very uh, low compliant patients, we, we have a lot of these kids and many of them are low compliant, some, sometimes due to age, but also due to special circumstances, Down syndrome or uh, autism. So we developed um, a protocol we call PINCO process to increase compliance in ophthalmology. 
And what we have been trying to do is reduce the stress levels of the kid. It will finally ultimately reduce your own stress levels and it will speed up the process. I was quite skeptical when, um, when um, um, our, uh, when my team uh, wanted to establish this because I was thinking that I would lose time as a, as a doctor and surgeon by establishing lengthy processes. But now I have really learned that no, in fact, it's the opposite. I gain time. So what we did a few years ago, we first plotted what we all do when a patient comes in through the door. By the time the patient leaves us, this is what we usually do. So it's a quite complex process and it induces stress in these children. So we started minimizing stress by the simplest means ever. You all can do it. Take a mobile phone, phone and do a few videos that explain what the child will encounter. If you are facing a child with autism, um, we send the links to these videos to the parents beforehand. The parents look at the videos so the child knows what will happen and the child will be so much calmer. Second thing is the parents come in with the child. They often don't even sit down. They walk straight to the first instrument because sitting down, filling out paperwork makes them nervous. So our parents get this form as a PDF sent home and they come with a filled out form. It's all about gaining time during which the child could build up nervosity. And lastly, that's a that's self-explaining. Oh, sorry, it goes forward now. That's self-explaining. Um, after the foam sheet, you, you probably shouldn't start with the tonometer as the first instrument. Just keep the, the biggest stress inducer for the for the end. And one more thing we learned in children with autism, give them positive reinforcers. You will be so much faster if you give the child what it loves most after each exam. It might be in their iPhone or the theme of the preferred pet. Tell the parents to bring a positive reinforcer. And lastly, we learned a lot of these things, not by inventing them, but by looking into other fields like pediatric dentists. So we visited some pediatric dentists and they gave us a lot of these tips. So in summary, screen early, treat early, treat with respect to compliance, do tight follow-ups, be aware of treatment failures in the short and in the long run, and take special measures in low compliance patients, for example, using our PINCO protocol. Thank you. Yes. Hello. Hello, yeah, thank you. Thank you for the nice uh, explanation. I think. Uh... Uh, may I ask a question, <clears throat> please? Yes, please. Yes. Uh, yes. yes. Yeah, thank you. Uh, the, uh, the question is to, to Farhad. Uh, Farhad, uh, what are the progression criteria that you use uh, to document progression in children? Because actually, in your case, I saw uh, there was just a steepening in the cornea while the thinning was not significant, just maybe seven microns, while the steepening was around two diopters. So what are the criteria that you depend on? Um, I thought you wanted us to keep the, the, the discussion before and uh, finish before midnight, Mazen. So <laughs> the... The, um, the second the second topography I showed was just an example. In fact, the the increase was almost four diopters. If you if you were to um, if you were to hover with the cursor over the KMX readings, so if I'm facing a three and a half or four diopters increase in my Panzer cam, no matter how much variation I have in my machine, and no matter how what the pachymetry readings tell me, I would progress. I would I would move along uh, if I have another um, drop in CDVA. But I want to see, I, as I told you, I don't even wait in these cases anymore. If um, this was 12 years ago and uh, nine years ago, I treat children and adolescents without looking for progression. I want to see a cone. If you are fine with this topography being a keratoconus, then yeah. treat it. I, I, have, I have a question. Can we ask one? Yes, please. Yes, of course. Yes. Yes. Just... So, uh, Dr. Hafezi, you mentioned that on an average, you're seeing it about three years, the drop in efficacy of the cross-linking in pediatric cases. So to preempt that, are you kind of thinking of doing a second cross-linking, say around two and a half years, or you only document a progression and then repeat cross-linking in these kids? No, we, um, we, we, we didn't see in the study, the study is eight years old now, we didn't see 
um, a progression after three years. What we saw in year one and two was a, a continuous flattening. And then in year three, we had, we had baseline values that were comparable to the pre-op state again. This is why we were speculating what would happen in the long run. And what the other groups have shown is that it might take a few years until you start losing efficacy. And we uh, have just finished analyzing our 10-year data, data um, Theo Zales and, and, and my group, uh, my, my, my kids. And uh, we also saw that the, the biggest age group that needed a recross linking after, after these years were the very young ones. So but how many years, I, I don't know. I don't have any clear, concise clinical recommendation, except for uh, not losing them out of sight and keeping the follow-ups going and encouraging them to come in whenever they feel something unusual after three or four years. And what percentage of your pediatric cases would you have repeated across linking? I don't have precise numbers on them, but uh, and the 10 year follow up is, is I think about 60 eyes, but I would have to look into the statistics. I don't have clear statistics, but from a biological standpoint, cell biological standpoint, it makes sense that there should be more children uh, susceptible to, um, to, um, to a repeated cross linking. Okay, thank you, Dr. Hafezi. Uh, if any other questions, Dr. Rohit. No, I think uh, let uh, Gatinel finish his, and uh, we will take in questions after that. I welcome Dr. Gatinel to come and speak about the important topic of no lab, no cone. And okay. I have personally seen it's quite effective, and I've read about his uh, literature also. So let him share his experience. All right. Thanks again for getting me, uh, giving me the opportunity to present this uh, concept of the no rub, no cone. Uh, it's glad to, glad to see all of you, and uh, so uh, I would like first to uh, thank my co-authors who work with me in Rothschild Foundation. I have no financial interest in any of the presented material here, and if you want to know more about my line of thinking, you may uh, read these two papers, and I will try to convey the essence of what, what are in these uh, two papers. So uh, I think where I differ from many of my colleagues, respected colleagues, is that I don't believe anymore that keratoconus is unknown in terms of etiology. I'm not even sure it's an ectatic process. I'm not sure, and I don't believe that genetics and environment are really at the first row of what creates and causes progression. On the other hand, the neurobnocon states that it's primarily a kind of a mechanical disease. And I'm going to try to explain it in more details. So my conception differs from this classic one. It's not a mixture of uh, uh, more or less fuzzy factors that may uh, provide a patient to come up with a kind of a keratoconus pattern at the topography. It's more the conjunctions of environmental factors, genetics, but most importantly, the action of rubbing the eye and when this rubbing exceeds the threshold, that is the energy that the cornea can uphold, then the cornea may deform, thin, and then deform it, and then end up in a permanent corneal deformation, a buckling or warpage, but not really an ectasia. I'm not saying genetics is nothing, but genetic works, I think, through two things. The, the tendency to be atopic or any having any disease which makes you prone to rub your eyes, and or in the what I call the keratotype, if you have a thin and a softer cornea, then you may be more um, willing to develop keratoconus for the same rubbing uh, energy. Uh, we've seen many times in the street, in the metro, people who, who do these things, and this may be like a banal gesture for you guys when you see something like that. But in fact, I believe that we did a big uh, step ahead when we decided to investigate with MRI what happens when someone rubs his eye and you can see it's quite um, striking that when someone rubs his eye, it's a volunteer here, not only the cornea but the whole globe, the, the orbital structures may uh, be uh, affected by the rubbing and to me it's not anymore a mystery that maybe in some cases, I believe it's all, but in some the cornea will thin and deform over time if you do this many times a day with consistent energy. 
And uh, I really believe that, as you see here, this kind of uh, rubbing may be enough when repeated over time to create the keratoconus disease as we, uh, that we witness in our practice. It's not a risk factor to me when you see this, it's more like a cause, it's directly exerted on the cornea. And uh, all the keratoconus risk factors such as atopy, Down syndrome, etc., are risk factors of eye rubbing. It's not only just a mechanical effect, a shearing, a distortion, it's gonna be also through a biological route, uh, expression of metalloproteinases, even in normal patients, the rubbing creates inflammation, uh, 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 temperature increase, which may upregulate some enzymes, etc. And for the same rubbing and frequency, uh, of course, thin and soft corneas to start with, exposed keratotype, will deform sooner. But there's for sure an inflammatory dimension that is around keratoconus, we all know that. So there are two routes for me, and because eye rubbing varies in intensity, duration, and frequency, that explains quite well why keratoconus varies also in severity and why there is a broad spectrum from normal corneas to keratoconus encompassing all the stages. There's no specific line below or beyond which you may say there's no or there is keratoconus. It's just a cornea deformation consecutive to a traumatic uh, agent. I can justify it. It's through the literature which is published, Logics. And I would also say, on the other hand, that this theory or this conjecture is way more plausible and compatible with what you observe clinically and what you read in the papers than the assumption, which is still an assumption of a spontaneously evolving corneal dystrophy of a non-origin. And uh, one first of one logical reason is that if you interview your patient, they will tell you that they rubbed their eye long before they had the first visual symptoms that may Cartagonis discovered. And that's the same patient you see when he rubbed his eye along with his brother, showing me eight years later how he does still. And this uh, patient has, no, not surprisingly, remember the MRI image, developed a corneal thinning and deformation more pronounced on the right eye. Because he says the right eye rubs with more vigor the right eye. Dr. So Gatinel, can you just hold on for a minute? Allah request all of us, all of the panelists to off their uh, mute their mic, please. Mm -hmm. I would be, it should be my video, maybe the sound. No, I think it's, I thought it was from the outset. Yes, thank you. Let's start. It's okay. So irobing is fre frequent, but highly variable. So is uh, keratoconus. So again, uh, rubbing is very variable. Causes are numerous. So dry eyes, allergy eyes, and uh, computer vision syndromes. If you do these like of uh, those Google search, in all of this search, if you go through the image, you will see people rubbing their eye. So rubbing is quite frequent. Fortunately, not everyone develops keratoconus. But if you rub a little bit like this woman with the pulp of your finger, this probably causes not keratoconus, but a form first, an asymmetric bow tie, a srax. And if you pay attention to these things now, in, and if you go in details with your patient, you will notice that there's a very nice correlation between all these form first thing and the way people rub, they form first rub and then they form first uh, evolve, right? That's interesting also that you consider the no rub, no cone theory as uh, possibly explaining the unilateral form. That's a very unilateral keratoconus, right eye is affected, not the left. But interestingly, this happened in a pair of twins, monozygotic twins, and there are four eyes here, same genetics, same environment. Why is the right eye having keratoconus? Simply because when you interview the twin sisters, one admits that she rubs since she's a mid-teen with the knuckles until the eye squeaks and she's right-handed. She sleeps on either side, but she rubs one eye only and that eye has developed keratoconus while the other did not. And the literature is full of examples like that. Why would people develop unilateral or very ultra high, highly asymmetrical keratoconus? Because we noticed also that sometimes the sleeping position is playing a critical role. That, that is the first question you may ask to a patient who has a asymmetrical form of keratoconus is how do you sleep, children included? 
when they sleep on one eye, like this guy, they develop uh, a right eye keratoconus. His mother sent me a picture, actual picture of her son sleeping, and he always did like that. And the first thing he did in the morning was to rub his eye. Not surprisingly, because when you sleep like this, you have a compression and heat for hours, triggering inflammation. Inflammation triggers rubbing, rubbing triggers back inflammation, rubbing and a vicious circle ensues. And then at the end, corneal thinning and deformation. We had just published in uh, um, cornea a case control study of keratoconus risk factors. And we found that eye rubbing, knuckle rubbing had the highest odds ratio. And also that the side and the prone sleep position have also an increased uh, prevalence in keratoconus patients. Again, uh, when you want to explain why a cone is on the left or on the right eye, what's most important is the rubbing side. And what may explain why a patient rubs one eye more, it's because he sleeps on it. Like a patient you do PRK on, on the day of the surgery, you say, do you rub your eye? He says, no. How do you sleep? I don't know. Back to the surgery, he had one month to, 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 to figure out. He says, you know what, doctor? This is exactly how I sleep on the right eyes, as you predicted. And I realize now that I rub my eyes at night in the morning. My eyes is probably irritated because of the extended contact over time, overnight on the pillow and, uh, and mattress. So again, uh, eye rubbing is the necessary ingredient for keratoconus. That's what we state. It's not just a ring a risk factor. It explains the differences. It accounts for the form freeze cases. And more importantly, as we are doing now, is sustained by the stabilization. Again, remember, keratoconus is focal and rubbing is focal. And if you rub your eyes, as in this patient, you may have sometimes a very inferior staining. Why that? Because if you rub the inferior part of the cornea, you may not even thin your cornea, but damage your iris. This is called an iridoschisis. And when the patient did is vigorous rubbing, he thin, deformed his cornea, had like a pellucid pattern, but more, again, interestingly, it injured his own iris. So again, it's not surprising that if you weaken the cornea, what you end up with is a kind of a change in the topography. The intracore technique was creating, you know, cuts, intrastromal cuts. And what happened immediately after the surgery was that the cornea would, would bulge in the center of this kind of a, uh, cuts. Uh, again, what may explain the topography variability in keratoconus is the impact of the rubbing exerted on the cornea, the Bell's phenomenon. If you rotate your, ball, your eyeball upward, you may rub the inferior part of the cornea more than the central one, etc., etc. In the literature, eye rubbing is very well documented up to almost 92% in a pediatric theory. In adults, it's been documented since like 1976 that 75% of patients acknowledge at the first visit they rubbed their eye and they did before they had keratoconus. Many anecdotal cases of keratoconus occurred and have been reported after unilateral or bilateral rubbing for another case or for another reason. And uh, I would say to finish that if you don't believe this, then you must not believe the classic theory because at least what I convey you makes sense, I believe. But what is in the literature does not. Primary genetic disease, when only 10% of cases have a familial history, when 90% of cases are sporadic, it's not a primary genetic disease. It's not even a true ectasia. Why that? Because of the way we interpret specular topography. We do it in the wrong way. If you see a red area here, it's not an ectasia at all. If you look at the profile of the cornea here, it's steep, but it's not bulging. It's not ectatic. It's not a global tissue ectasia. It's a misinterpretation. The cornea is flatter upward and steep because it has been thin, it becomes weak, and then it sags down somehow. So it's not a global tissue ectasia. There's no expansion as in a, a ectasia, like if you inflate a balloon. That's more like a, a, like a ping pong ball you press on. The surface is the same. And we measured thousands of surfaces of healthy eye. We compared it to cornea. This is the anterior surface. You see there's no difference, not even at the posterior surface. The area, the surface area is roughly the same in keratoconus and normal eye. So there's no inflation. There's no bulging. It's just a warpage. A distortion and Steve Kleist published this 20 years ago at the conclusion 
reached by the same kind of measurement. So that's keratoconus. You rub, you thin for reasons I discussed really quickly, biological enzymes, etc. Then the cornea sags down, it flattens vertically. That's why you have inverted astigmatism. Flatter here, steeper there. Isometric deformation, like in the Marfan syndrome, unlike in the Marfan syndrome. That's a true ectasia. Marfan eyes is a, have genetic issues that primarily affects the connective tissue, so as keratoconus is supposed to be. But in that case, then that's very important. If you have a soft tissue, it wouldn't be it wouldn't be like a keratoconus. It would be thin, but inflated. That is flatter, like the sclera is flatter. The eye is bigger, etc. That's a true ectasia, not at all as a keratoconus. If you compare Marfan and keratoconus, most people believe that keratoconus is a kind of Marfan but not discovered yet kind of disease. But in Marfan, we've cleared the way. The gene is identified. Everything is identified. In keratoconus, purely corneal disease. Well, I would bet now that if there's a gene, we would have found it. And again, if you believe keratoconus is primarily a soft cornea without any trauma on it, then why is the cornea not like in the Marfan syndrome? It should be, but it's not. So I think this whole theory solves the mystery of keratoconus. That's a complex slide, but it's quite, I think, the way things work. You have risk factor for eye rubbing, surface inflammation. You have two roots. The pink one upward here is the, uh, is the uh, um, biological root created by surface inflammation, but it's not enough because corneal weakening enough should lead to a Marfan syndrome pattern not a focal, thin, and steep cornea in the center, right? So you need eye rubbing, which causes also a bio biological impairment, but also a mechanical stress. And through all these things together, when the weakening is more than what the cornea can resist to, then the permanent deformation occurs, and that's what we call keratoconus. Again, caused by a combination of eye rubbing, maybe night compression, which is very found in the, in the, in the patient. And, and finally, we have a website, you can visit it. We put a lot of material on it and we show that if you don't rub your eye, you have exactly what you can observe sometimes after cross-linking, even central flattening without any surgery. This is a study we do and over three years now, we have found that when really people stop to rub their eye, when they sleep differently, when they prevent the eye to be rubbed or squished or whatever, then all the parameters you can see get flat. There's no uh, evolution. So I hope I've convinced some of you that keratoconus first is not an ectasia, but the phenotypic expression of a plastic deformation of primary mechanical origin. And this mechanical origin is eye rubbing, which may exert different effect depending on the keratotype. And this is also linked to the sleeping position to explain the laterality. We demonstrate it through rational and clinical evidence and I think the suppression of irobin can lead to the halting of the disease and more importantly to the potential disease eradication. And this should invite us to completely re revise or, uh, or reconsider what is truly keratoconus. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Gatton. It was quite explanatory, a descriptive talk. And I do believe that we, uh, many patients, they do give a history of irobin, mainly with the knuckles. Uh, mm -hmm. I'll ask the panelists if they have any questions. Uh, do you have any uh, questions from the audience or any questions which uh, uh, question, uh, I'll just start with is there any multicentric uh, study for the no rub, no cone? That's one of the questions that has been asked. Uh, is the question is the, no rub, no we cone? Don't, we don't, yeah, it's not difficult to ask someone to rub his eye until he gets a keratoconus, so it's difficult. But what we have is a study where at least we provide you with a control group, which is not in most studies of cross-linking or whatever, is that we have patients that really obey to the prescription, pre to, to the commandment to stop rubbing. It's not easy. It's very difficult sometimes, I agree. But when they do it, then what we observe is a stabilization or even sometimes a little regression. But it's, it's not something you can, you can prove using uh, uh, like prospective group where you ask people to rub. 
But I would say the literature is full of cases of, of uh, anecdotal evidences that rubbing in itself can cause keratoconus. That's something we all agree. But if this is a universal mechanism, I say yes. And if you don't believe me, I ask you, how can you explain them? And nobody can explain. So, when any so oh, until we don't explain a different way. So any patients, when you come to a clinic, do you just do you tell them stop the rubbing and then you manage them medically or do you just tell them to come as a follow-up and then try to see his, how is the progression, how is the keratoconus on topography? Yeah, yeah it takes a long time time it's longer than a cross-linking you have to interview them if they have uh, parents relatives you have to really ask them first you have to tell them you must come back one month from now especially those who say i'm not sure i wrote that much because then you discover how one month later the, the, the speech has changed and how the patient realizes that sometimes he rubs during the night in the morning that's why he tells you no i don't think i do it but then you realize that under the shower is doing like frenetically uh, eye rubbing so once they have, they've, they have identified that, then you have to have them stop it. And that's quite difficult in teenagers and children. That's why I, sometimes I tell them, you know, cross-linking may be good for you because once you've had the surgery, you're not, you're not gonna be willing to rub your eyes anymore because of the, of the pain or whatever. But I don't believe that's necessary because if you follow the, the, my line of thinking, what causes keratoconus being mechanical, stopping it, solves the issue. It's not going to get back to where, where it started, but at least you can, you can stop it. Can I, can I ask a question to Damien? Sure. Uh, okay, Damien, uh, I wanted always to ask you this question. So this is great, a great platform to ask it to you without a lot of uh, pressures. Um, we've done a study and we published an AJO following, uh, uh, looking at pediatric first degree relatives of keratoconic patients. Mm -hmm. All of our patients, we used to ask them, bring over your kids, uh, brothers or sisters. And we discovered that we have on the average 17% uh, of these patients had actually keratoconus. Uh, if you were 10 years, uh, the, the possibility is 11%. But you, if you were 18 years, which was the max for the study, it was 25%, one out of four. But more importantly, what we discovered that many of these patients did not have keratoconus, but they had, so the siblings or the offsprings, uh, they had actually very thin cornea with high astigmatism, but no keratoconus. Now, we did not at the time do any biomechanical study, corpus or something. But would you explain, I'm just trying to think along your theory that rubbing can cause the cornea not to, not to develop keratoconus, but to show thin cornea and high astigmatism? No, but that's the other way, Sh Shadi. Okay. It's like you would tell me we've, we, 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 we have people who come for, for sunburn at the hospital. We ask their relative to come and they had light skin. Of course, if you have light skin, you're going to get sunburn quicker. That is, if you have a family with thin cornea, then for the same rubbing, they will be weaker to the rubbing and they will deform more uh, quite quickly. Some people rub and the first thing in rubbing is not only the deformation, but there's a focal thinning. So that's an, another effect. If you have families of people with the same genetics, prone to atopy, living in the same environment with the same allergens, it's not surprising that they will rub. And one, one very uh, important thing is that when you have uh, siblings, like family of five children, the one who has keratoconus is usually the one who rubs his eye. It's easy, you can ask the patient, oh, it's, it's, it's nice what you say, doctor, because guess what? This is the only allergic child we have but maybe they have also thin cornea. The cornea thickness is very inherited. That's very genetic. It's been published extensively. You have families with thin cornea. If you have thin shelves at home, you put the same amount of book, they will bend quicker than if you have thick shelves. I think that's an explanation which may look simple, but it's logical and it makes sense and it echoes the clinics. So, but again, so your genetic... So your genetic yeah. thinking is that the patients can have genetic predisposition, but not necessarily a gene for keratoconus or multiple exactly. gene for The best analogy, and I always repeat this one, is a sunburn. I mean, if you have a light skin, you go to the beach, you are prone to get a sunburn. But as long as you prevent UV rays to hit your skin, that is rubbing your eye, you're not going to get sunburn. That's my point. Eye rubbing is necessary. It's not the only thing. If you have a dark skin, you go at 6 p.m., no sunburn, right? Light skin, 12 p.m., sunburn. But the difference is, again, 
the, the balance between the cornea resistance and the mechanical stress. There's one question. I learned this through unilateral keratoconus patient. You have the same genetics, the same guy. He has two eyes. One is keratoconus, the other one is not. The patient says, yeah, I slept always on my right eye. Some people tell me, yes, that's because he has keratoconus. He sleeps on his eye. I say, come on. He sleeps on his eye since he's maybe a baby because the parents did it like this. He had a window in his room. Some people tell me I sleep on the left side because there's a window here. I don't want to see the light in the morning. And then they have keratoconus on their eye. See, after 10 years of sleeping, rubbing, sleeping, rubbing. When you sleep on your eye, compression, heat, the heat makes the cornea uh, softer. In the morning, the cornea is swollen. The, the edema, relative edema, makes the cornea more fragile to the same rubbing effect. So if you rub in the morning, it's worse than in the day, maybe. Thank you, Dr. Gattinen. Well, your patients sleep on the back. First thing is, how do you sleep? Even sometimes before they rub, I say, how do you sleep? They are oh, sleep like this. I say, okay, I know, that's okay. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Gatinel. There's one question for doc, uh, Dr. Hafezi. What's the minimum age of cross-linking you have done? Children, what is the minimum age? Um, personally, the youngest I have treated with a very distinct uh, progression because I was even reluctant to treat this boy was five years old. And uh, he never rubbed his eyes, which may mean something or not mean something, but he had a very clear progression and um, we had to cross-link him under general anesthesia. Yeah, that was the other question. How much percentage was in sedation or GA? Children. I'm sorry? Percentage of kids you are doing it under sedation or under general anesthesia? Um, very few because... Um, um, Right now, I even have nine-year-olds that are cooperative. We usually show them the OR um, at the last visit before, before the actual intervention. So they can lie down on the bed. They can get acquainted to it. They bring a parent uh, with them into the OR that sits next to them. And so I'm down to eight years now is the youngest that I've been able to treat without general anesthesia. And it's quite rare in Switzerland to see seven-year-olds with a cone. So that's just a handful we needed to treat from the normal population. It's a little different in, in, in Down syndrome and autism. It all depends on the individual compliance. Okay. So any other questions from the panelists? Because I have a few questions which uh, is not relevant to the first two talk, which is open for the panelists. Uh, how do you uh, diagnose the progression? What do you, how you define as a progression of keratoconus? Like, how do you define that? On what parameters you define that the keratoconus is progressing? Uh, to me, you, you must do different maps. I, I'm, I'm not fully in line with Farad. When I saw his slides, I would not say that's a progression. I would even say it could be a regression because where, when the cornea steeps where it was flat and when it flattens where it was steep, to me, it's more like a kind of regression. You must have a steepening, increase, increase in the steepening where it was steep and a thinning. If there's no thinning, if it's just a shape change, you never know what it could be. In my experience, sometimes a change in the sleeping position, um, a remodeling of the epithelium. But to me, it must be really clear that where it was steep, it gets steeper by 1.5 diopters because that's the repeatability we found in our topograph. And it must be thin along the thinnest point. If it doesn't thin, I've seen people coming for progression for second opinion. They had regression. They were steep where it was flat and flat where it was steep. It's more like a regularization. Although you have a red area on the difference map, it's not enough. Uh, I have a question uh, for uh, Kettinel. Uh, see, we published uh, repeatability of all the machines, uh, the Cirrus, the Metacam, and uh, I think it was an op scan and uh, the op scan and it was in IOBS 2016 or 17 and we found that in keratoconus the repeatability was 0 0.6 diopter in a pentacam cirrus was little more the op scan was a little on the higher side uh, close to around 0 0.9 to 1 diopter so uh, and uh, most of the published reports suggest that uh, you're close to around 0.5 to 0.65 to point up to 0.7 diopter in uh, in the keratoconic eye. So why would you consider 1.25, 1.5 diopters, which is too steep, uh, even for a repeatability range? 
No, I agree with you. It depends on the stage, but I was referring to the to the advanced stage. In in early stages, maybe one seven is better, but it's proportional to the to the stage. So in advanced stage, it's difficult to say it's progressing if you don't have a, like kind of at least one point five doubters change. And you know when it's progressing, it's steepening where it was steep. So it's like the it's like the map that you had before, but exaggerated. When it's completely different, you may suspect sometimes an alignment because remember those guys have high order astigmatism. Sometimes they look uh, two three degrees away, and that's enough in a very distorted shape to create a kind of difference map which is not exactly the same. So, so can we ask this question to Farhad? I think he's or Dr. Sinjab, if you would yeah. like to answer. Yes, please. Uh, I would like to comment on this uh, uh, point. Uh, actually, uh, I found that the best uh, system to uh, document progression is the ABCD uh, billing, keratoconus staging, because it depends on zones rather than points. So, because you know that the points are uh, prone to uh, artifacts. Um, especially with the rubbing, uh, punctate epithelial erosions, dry eye associated with keratoconus. So uh, there will be like false findings. So the ABCD depends on zones uh, rather than points. Um, and you know that these zones are the um, radius of curvature in the anterior and posterior um, corneal surfaces in, other, in uh, addition to the uh, thickness. So uh, if the ABCD is available, uh, this will be perfect and uh, Professor Bellin has videos uh, on the YouTube explaining how to interpret this ABCD staging. Now, if we don't have this software, I depend on two parameters, the K-max and thinning together, because if we depend on one of them, then maybe we are in artifacts or maybe in uh, regression, as uh, uh, Damien said. Now, um, uh, what I depend on, if I don't have the ABCD, a change in the K-max more than, or uh, let's say, starting from two diopters and above, uh, in addition to thinning 15 microns and above, uh, in order to go out of the noise of any machine. Because I found that the noise in measurement of thickness is 12 microns. And the noise of measurement of K-max is almost 1.5, 1.6, according to the amount of distortion in the of, uh, of the cornea, because the higher the distortion in the, in the cornea, the more the noise, the higher the noise. So actually I'm depending on these two parameters if I don't have the ABCD. And uh, let me just ask you a question, Mazen. Um, I've been just revisiting the, the topography, the second topography I've shown and I have a focal increase of almost four diopters and uh, what Damian called uh, a regression, a compensatory regression of 1.7. So one area, um, uh, one area bulged by four and the other did a compensatory movement of 1.7. This still is a clear progression for me, isn't it for you? Yeah, uh, now uh, regarding uh, children, I don't wait for progression. No, no, I, I know, but if, if this were not a child, adult, but yeah, adult. if he is an adult, okay, um, if there is no thinning uh, associated with the steepening, I wait, I mm -hmm. recapture the patient. Usually I take three captures in every session, three captures by the same mm -hmm. technician, and most, yeah. and most times I'm doing this in order I to... I do too, but... Uh -huh. Yeah, no, in order to, to avoid the uh, inter-observer and intra-observer yeah. and so on. So, um, and of course, before I take the capture, I am sure that there is no surface problem, there is no dry eye, there is no punctate epithelial erosions in order to avoid misinterpretation. So if I find steepening, if it, even if it is four diopters, but the thickness is still the same, I don't, I don't uh, consider it as progression. I, maybe I will bring the patient after one month, two months, mm -hmm. three months. I recapture the patient and then I can uh, decide. Well, that's interesting. So we have different attitudes because I um, burnt my fingers doing this in some instances. And why can't the, the change of form precede the thinning? Why don't you have a disease that is biomechanically instable and you have a change of form and then you have a secondary thinning? So I would still treat such a patient even if I only have a 10 diopter change in thickness that is the background noise of my machine. 
But Shadi, what do you think? Uh, I think uh, for, for, I fully agree with you. What I notice is that pachymetry is the last thing that changes. So I really don't depend on the pachymetric changes. Almost all my patients, when they progress, I mean, again, we do three measurements at a time and we keep telling them to follow up before we directly commit to cross-linking. And then we always see changes in the, the steep area, and, but not really in pachymetry. Pachymetry is the last thing really I would look at, honestly. Um, another thing is that we've done a project with Cynthia Robert, and, and interestingly, it, it, it all stemmed from the last cross-linking expert where we had this kind of discussion with Cynthia. So we, we did the project, which actually we submitted now to AJO, where we looked at the K-max and we looked at the zonal K-max all the way to three millimeter in diameter. And we found it's, it only improves till you hit two millimeters. And when you hit the two millimeter, you have sudden improvement and repeatability from one diopter uh, below 50, uh, to 0 0.5, but above 50, the repeatability jumps all the way to 2.32. And then it goes down to one diopter, which is the clinically acceptable. So um, we even K-max, we need to go all the way to two millimeter in diameter and even up to three millimeter to find it. And that's why I believe the ABCD of Bannon has one really Im uh, major improvement is that it looks at the thinnest point and builds the uh, points around it, the curvature anterior and posterior based on the thinnest point. Now, as we know, the thinnest point, even if it changes by repeated measurements, it's gonna be a thinnest point. The possibility for the thinnest point to change is much less than the curvature because curvature depends on fixation, especially in keratoconus with steep corneas. That's why with higher K-max, the, the, K, the higher K-max, the repeatability even worse. So I think even now, I noticed that the latest version of CSO with an OCT machine adopted the ABCD. I think it will be even better to follow patients post cross linking because the haze wouldn't affect the pachymetry the way, um, you know, with, with the ABCD, they look at the posterior uh, uh, curvature around the thinnest point, And this is affected by shine flow, while with OCT, it will be better. So I think ABCD has one way to look at it with less uh, repeatability problems. Now, uh, let me comment on this point. Um, yes, uh, I respect, of course, your, your opinions, but we have to uh, take into consideration what Damien uh, mentioned regarding the rubbing. Maybe the steepening is because of rubbing. What do you think, Damien? <laughs> I'm drinking your speech. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, it's... Uh, it's you, if you come and visit me in Paris, you will notice that I... I when I see a progression on my topography difference map, I know that the patient has rubbed and usually they admit that because again, those who stop, they don't. Also, what's it, what is very important is you have to realize that because the cornea is not, the surface area remains more or less constant. If it steepens somewhere, it must flatten somewhere else because the average curvature of the cornea, that is if you measure the cornea point by point, the curvature, and you do an average at the end, it's not very different from an advanced keratoconus to a normal cornea. That is, normal cornea is between 43 and 45 K on the whole map, or maybe let's say 39 and 43. The keratoconus will be, of course, on a wider scale, but the average will be 42. So that's why I would tell you that if the steepening that you measure is not inferior and located close to where it was before, like in the map that Farah showed, that is, the steepening was more like oblique and superior. I think that's more a fixation issue or a remodeling, but it's not a progression. Uh, any steepening which is superior to me is a good sign because the cornea cannot really steep superiorly in keratoconus, giving the usually gravitational way. And maybe gravity plays a role, by the way, in, in the keratoconus. I would dream to take people in the space with keratoconus or have keratoconus. That's for Faraz. Faraz is very um, uh, imaginative in his experience. Faraz, could you design a topograph where you can have people measured upside down to see if gravity plays a role? <laughs> Let's like ask it. Elon Musk if he sends us up there. <laughs> or the other way is to put the, no, you, you put people upside down and you see what happened. That would be interesting. But uh, me, <laughs> will you volunteer? <laughs> I think I think the water. Yeah, I don't know what what precedes what, but thinning to me is essential in keratoconus. When we do those measurements in very normal eyes compared to form first, usually the difference we find is in the gradient of thinning very centrally. So if you have a th central thinning in the patient, that could be the first sign of keratoconus. 
Now, so, to me, it doesn't mean he has a disease. To me, it means he rubs his eyes. Thank you, Dr. Gatnal. Sorry to break you here. Can we move to the next speaker? Dr. Rajesh Fukla, can you just start your presentation? See, after Dr. Fukla, I think we have... Uh, Okay, the second talk is there. We'll take it up. Okay, so I'll be talking about stromal augmentation using cross clinical lenticule for keratoconus. I have no financial interest in this presentation. So, this clinical case this is a 20 year old female. She had moderate keratoconus, grade 3, grade 4, wearing contact lenses for the past four years. Suddenly, for the past six months, she was unable to tolerate her contact lens wear. Uncorrected vision in the in both eyes was about 2200. Best corrected, improving in the right eye to 2080, left eye 2060. This is the right eye topography. You can see the maximum steep K is about 61.48 diopters, and the thinnest point is about 423. We tried different contact lenses. Somehow, she was unable to tolerate the lens. So we just went ahead and discussed the options that were present with us. So we gave the option of doing the cross-linking to arrest the progression, but she was interested more in the visual improvement. Uh, the contact lens option was out because she was definitely unwilling. Intracorneal ring segment we did discuss, but by the time we discussed with the, uh, the kind of outcomes with the intracorneal ring segment, she was not very really happy, understanding that the, it could be slightly unpredictable. And the next procedure was a little bit more invasive. That was the uh, lamellar keratoplasty to try and uh, get the cornea anatomy back to normal. So at that point of time, there was several reports from uh, Netherlands, from the Melis group, talking about Bowman's layer transplant. So we did, did discuss the option with her, and she was very keen on the same. And because it's kind of a reversible procedure, so we did go ahead and involve her in the project that we were doing back in 2000. 15, 2016. So this was the inspiration for this project that we were doing. We were impressed with the results of the Bowman's layer, but the Bowman's layer alone was, uh, we felt that would not give mechanical strength. And later on, after we presented our initial data, we have seen several publications showing good results of intrastromal lenticule implantation using the femtosecond laser. And this paper from Italy, where they use the lenticules obtained after hyperopic smile procedures and they use these lenticules for 10 cases with central keratoconus and they found that uh, over a period of six months follow-up all of them had favorable outcomes. So in our patient we prepared the lenticule using the femtosecond laser. It was eight millimeter in diameter, uh, 150 degree edges, 100 microns in thickness and it was prepared from the surface including the Bowman's layer and we decided to cross-link it. Basically we wanted to strengthen the collagen and also the exposure of, we, we know that if you expose to do the cross-linking, you reduce the stromal keratocyte. So that would let, make the tissue less immunogenic as well. We did the accelerated uh, cross-linking because the tissue was only 100 microns in thickness. So basically the, the tissue was <clears throat> placed on the artificial chamber, the epithelium was removed. And then we used the femtosecond laser to create the eight millimeter lenticule. This was then soaked in riboflavin for about 15 minutes. And then we placed it back on the artificial chamber on the cornea, and then we exposed it to UV light. And at the end of it, uh, we uh, took the lenticule, immersed it in uh, uh, moxifloxacin hydrochloride, uh, Vigamox for about five minutes, and then we used it for surgery. In the patient's eye, the surgery was performed under topical anesthesia. So we used the Zima femtosecond laser to create a nine millimeter diameter pocket. And this pocket was at a depth of about 200 microns. And it had two uh, openings, one two millimeter on one side and a four millimeter opening on the other side. So we went with a blunt dissector just to open up the lamellar pocket that was created by the laser because there were some fibers that were still adherent. It was not a very uh, clean uh, interface as we would see in a LASIK flap. Then we took the lenticule and we placed it 